All right, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Appreciate the Lord's blessing upon our time together this morning as we learn that the chief sin is to blaspheme the Lord. In Paul's case, Saul of Tarsus' case, refusing to acknowledge that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Reading again his testimony, beginning at verse number 12, because his testimony is the strength of Timothy's ministry and the prelude for the charge that he is about to give to this young pastor. Verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. God's grace was more abundant than Saul's blasphemy. God's grace was more abundant than Saul's persecution, Paul's injurious conduct. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Thank God. Before I am chief, how be it, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Took someone who did such harm to the church and allowed that same person to be such a great blessing to the church. What a, what a pattern to all that would come after. You can be saved, your life can be changed, God can use you the rest of your days. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. Now you got to get saved first. You're no good to God or a man until you get saved, but if you get saved then God can use you. Now, unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So that's Paul's background. He was a blasphemer. Now he's in the ministry. He was injurious to the church. Now he's a great help to the church. Verse 18, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Father, help me to help your people tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. So this is the real, true, genuine challenge and burden of the ministry it seems that for every changed life that is suddenly devoted to Jesus Christ, there is someone abandoning the faith and going back out into the world. For everyone that catches fire and wants to sell out and live for Jesus Christ, there's someone who says, I've had all of this I'm interested in. Let me do something else for the rest of my days. And Paul's challenge to Timothy that we'll develop this evening is simply this. If someone wants to follow Christ, help them. If someone wants to follow Satan, get out of their way. It is, it is Timothy's responsibility as it was Paul's responsibility as it is our responsibility to help everyone who will turn from blasphemy to righteousness to help them grow into faith. It is our responsibility to help everyone that will stop being injurious to God's church, to help them, strengthen them, so they can be a great blessing to God's church. But it's also our responsibility that everyone who wants to injure God's church needs to find the company of people who think like they do, and it's not in here. Amen. Salvation is available to all. Church fellowship is not. Yes, sir. Salvation is a freely given gift of God, and regardless of what sins are in your life right now, if you're not saved, you can be saved right now. Amen. 
But there are sins that if you choose to retain them or revert to them, you cannot continue to fellowship with God's people. And it's a wonder anyone would want to. In our Bible conference, we heard about that, uh, that woman taken in adultery and she could not be put to death because the legal requirements were not met by the crowd that brought her to Jesus. It's quite interesting, the Lord did not say to that adulterous woman, stay and sin no more. He told her to go and sin no more. And when you, I, we're not going to put you to death by stoning because we don't have the man and the woman as the law requires but until you get that straightened out, you need to go out there and straighten that out. Yeah. Yes, sir. And so here's the real, the real pain, the real heartache that Timothy experienced. I want you to turn with me back to Acts chapter 19. Back to Acts chapter 19, when the great revival broke in Ephesus. And of all the accounts of souls being saved in Ephesus, this this move of God in this city is the one that really truly turned a town upside down. The Bible says in Acts 19 and verse number 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, uh, 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 which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? That's why I'd leave the whole casting out devils business alone. Uh, they might not think as highly of you as you do. <laughs> And the man whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. <laughs> it didn't go well that day. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and said, Why can't we just bring these to church with us? No, they burn them before all men. They're done with that life. They're done with those practices. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces. So we paid a lot of money for this stuff. Burn it. The money's gone anyway. So mightily grew the Word of God and prevailed. Praise the Lord. Verse 23. At the same time, there was no small stir about that way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, we know that by this craft we have our wealth. They are selling so many Mary, I mean, Diana statues. <laughs> they're not just making a living, they're making wealth. And now their income is plummeting because people are getting saved and not adding Jesus to their idol collection. They're getting saved and they're not shopping at the idol store any longer. Amen. Real salvation, real conversion, real changed life. Praise the Lord. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying they be no gods which are made with hands. Imagine that. So the, not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised. Notice the order. We're losing money and Diana's not being respected. <laughs> first things first. <laughs> it's hurting our wallet. And her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion, having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions, and traveled. They rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered into the, under the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Sometimes you just got to stay out of it, keep from losing your life. Some therefore cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. They don't know why they're mad, they're just mad. They don't know why they're in the riot, they're just in the riot. They don't know why they're in the theater shouting, they're just in the theater shouting, because that's what the crowd's doing. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with a hand and would have made his defense unto the people. He's targeted as a representative 
of the converted, of the changed, of the saved, of the formerly worshiping the goddess Diana and her idols and now associated with Paul the preacher who believes in a creator God. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, defense, defense, defense. <laughs> oh, no, no. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. I can't imagine people filling a stadium and shouting for two hours. Sure you can. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Go ahead. People are serious about their religion in some of these cities. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there? And so he makes this speech, and things settle down for the time being. Here's what I want you to see. In the midst of this great moving of God, this revival that is shaking a city, Alexander is identified as a spokesman for Paul's company, Though he's not allowed to speak, he is willing, where Paul might have died, he is willing to hold up his hands and say, please listen to what I have to say on behalf of Christ in opposition to Diana. Now come back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19, shipwreck, Satan, blaspheme of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander. Alexander. You know what hurts? When somebody who really gets out of the world gets back in the world. You know what hurts? When somebody who really stands for Jesus caves in. You know what hurts? When somebody tells their town, their job, their school, their family, I've found something better, it's Jesus Christ. And then a year later says, I didn't find anything better, I'm back. It really hurts. It really hurts. The testimony of Christ is not harmed by worshipers of Diana. It's harmed by worshipers of Diana who leave Diana and turn to Christ and then return to Diana. To blaspheme is to show a lack of reverence. To blaspheme God is to show a lack of reverence for God. These people revered Diana. They were countered by a group of people who revered Jesus Christ. And two of them at least who revered Christ ceased to revere him and returned their allegiance, their reverence, their devotion to a false goddess. And it greatly hurt the cause of Christ. And the Holy Spirit had to write to Timothy and say, Timothy, the devil has them. You've got to let him have them. You can't follow them out there. You can't justify them. You can't... You can't water down the church so that it's a mixture of, of Ephesian goddess worship and Christianity. You can't do it, Timothy. You've got to hold the line. But Lord, it's two of our best men. They're not your best men if they're blasphemers. But Lord, it's two of the pillars of the church. If they're the pillars of the church, the church will crumble and fall. And as much as it hurts to see someone turn aside and go back to the world or back to their old religion or give themselves over to that which is satanic, you cannot retain in church fellowship those who want to fellowship with devils. Are you a devil worshiper? The Lord can cast out that devil. You are welcome to come and be part of this, but you're not welcome to, once part of this, invite the devil in to Man. keep company here. And it's a, it's a tough matter. Now, here's, here's the problem. And, and I, I can't speak to another church. I wish I could. I can't address all these congregations across our town and our nation. I wish I could. But the problem with the Christianity, this 50% Christianity and 50% goddess Diana, is it causes the true God to be disrespected right. yes, by saved people and lost people. Right. 
This, this Christianity falsely so-called that doesn't require holiness and righteousness and separation and dedication and self-denial has caused unsaved people to say, why would I leave the world for Christianity when the Christians show me by their conduct they love the world more than they love Jesus? Why would I give up this when the people I work with who say they're saved haven't given up anything? Yeah. We'll show you surprisingly the first use of blaspheme in your Bible, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're talking now about your life on the job, my life in, in the city, your life in the marketplace, some of you, your lives in the schoolhouse. 2 Samuel chapter 12, David knows the Lord. David sings praise to the Lord. David proclaims the truth of the Lord. And then David commits adultery and has the husband of his adulteress killed to try and cover his crime. It's bad business. Nathan the prophet comes in, as, as you heard as recently as our... Bible conference confronts him about his sin. Nathan exposes David's sin. Look at verse number 13. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Well, that's true, but it's not true enough. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. So, so David, David got things right with God. But David had made things wrong with more than God. Verse 14, Nathan says, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And David prayed for that child and prayed for that child and prayed for that child, and the child did not live. What did you just read? You read that the enemies of the Lord lost respect for the Lord because someone who sang about the Lord and preached about the Lord and fought for the Lord and represented the Lord committed deeds that the heathen, many of them do not commit. There are a lot of people in your town who are not saved and don't cheat on their wives. Why? They know it's wrong. There are a lot of people in your town that are saved and, and are faithful to their husbands. Why? They know, they know they're supposed to be. Well, what are they to think when after you give them gospel tracts in, in, in the Christmas card every year and invite them to church every so often, what are they to think when you abandon your spouse and take up with some other man or some other woman? That your God has no real influence on your life. that causes them to disrespect the Lord. When someone on your job gets saved and you work up the courage to tell them, I'm a Christian too, they shouldn't say, you are? Yeah. <laughs> I never knew. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter number 2. Alexander was known in Ephesus. Alexander was known in the church at Ephesus. Alexander had chosen the Lord over Satan and then at some point changed his mind and chose Satan over the Lord. And it hurt the work of God in the city of Ephesus. Romans chapter 2, verse number 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. That's, that's all good, don't you think? These are God's people, Jews, and they're, they're boasting. We know the true God. And they're correct. Verse 18, we know the will of God. And, and we approve the law of God, the commandments of God, the teaching of God are more excellent than this Roman junk that, that our neighbors and our fellow citizens adhere to and follow. 
and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? <laughs> Wait a minute. You said there's a true and living God, and that true and living God gave your nation special commandments, and one of them is thou shalt not steal, but you're a thief. And thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, we turn from the goddess Diana and her silver shrines. Dost thou commit sacrilege? Have you gone back to them? Now watch. Thou that makest thy boast of the law th through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Isn't that horrible? America is not a Christian nation, but Saudi Arabia thinks it is. Iran thinks it is. Iraq thinks it is. Kuwait thinks it is. Yemen thinks it is. And when they look at America, they see a God that promotes filth and depravity and sin. And the true and living God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of the conduct of the people who claim to know him. And it's important that we get saved, but it's important that we live saved. Yes, sir. And it's important that we go out and tell everybody and claim the name of Christ and, and put Jesus saves on your shirt and on your car and in your front yard and on your ball cap, and, but not if you're going to live like they do. Yeah, right. yeah. Or worse. Well, I just think the Lord will forgive me. He forgave David, but he messed up the whole kingdom. He could forgive Alexander, and I hope he did, but he messed up a church and the church's testimony in a town. It's a serious matter. Somewhere, somewhere in America last week and somewhere in America this week, some preacher is going to extort a bunch of money from a church or, or a, a congregation of people. And it'll make the news. The bigger the church, the, the farther that news will spread. 200 honest, sincere, dedicated ministers in that town will never get one article written about them. They'll never get two minutes on a newscast. The people who make the news in the world are the people who sell out Christ and live like the world. Because Satan wants blasphemers recognized. And it's a serious matter. It's a heartbreaking matter to Timothy, the pastor. It's a heartbreaking matter to Paul, the, the evangelist. It's a heartbreaking matter to a congregation to have a man as well known as Hymenaeus known for turning back. To have a man once as important as Alexander now be important for all the wrong reasons. In fact, you say, well, how do you know he went back to the old way? I'll show you. Come to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse number 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. He's in with that smithing crowd. He gets saved. He's in with that Christian crowd. He's blaspheming in 1 Timothy, and by 2 Timothy, he's back to being part of the smithing crowd. And the Bible says he did Paul and the church much evil. Look at, look at the next phrase. The Lord reward him according to his works. 
That's a pretty rough prayer for a preacher to pray about a professing Christian. In 1 Timothy, just if he wants to follow Satan, let him go. In 2 Timothy, I hope God will give him what he's got coming. That's pretty rough. You don't want a preacher praying that way about you. Righteously. Now, no, wait, it, 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 it hurts. It, it, it's going to become more painful. Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. He's now standing in opposition to the preaching of the Word of God that once shook Ephesus. If you're going to go back to the bars, to the drugs, to the carousing, to the cursing, to the swearing, to the dishonesty, move to another town. Go someplace where nobody knows you ever claim the name of Christ. Get, all, get everything off your social media and start all over again. Don't have, I'm a heathen, and then three years, I'm a Christian, and now I'm back, I'm a heathen again. Just, just scrub it, start over again. Because it hurts. It hurts. The up, the down, hope to God there's an up again, but there wasn't for Alexander. Now watch, here's, here's what, it, it gets, it, you're not sad already? Watch, it's going to become even more sad. Verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. When Paul writes 2 Timothy, is it not in his heart and in his mind that there was a day when Alexander stood with me? There was a day when I was charged and Alexander said, you stay out here, it's too dangerous. I'll go in there and raise my hand. And now Paul says, Alexander's gone. And I wish I had a man like him to stand for me when I'm in a bind. That's rough business. How many years ago would we have needed the building that we need now? If so many had not defected and returned to the life they once lived. Oh, I'd, very few of them decided they don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Very few of them decided that they don't believe in the Trinity. Very few of them decided they don't believe in the virgin birth of the Deity of Christ. But a lot of them decided, I sure miss those shrines. I sure miss those silver statues. I sure miss that, Ephe that theater at Ephesus. I sure miss that crowd in the stadium. I sure miss the camaraderie of people that can join arm in arm and chant for two hours about nonsense. If you don't stay in love with Jesus Christ, there's something inside you. It's always tugging, 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 tugging. Why do you have to live at odds with your culture? Why do you have to live at odds with your townspeople? Why do you have to be the weirdo on the job? Why do you have to be the freak in the neighborhood? Why can't you dress like the rest of the harlots in town? Why do you have to go to church three times a week? How come you can't join this and join that and participate in this and participate in that? And Alexander said, are you kidding? I found Jesus. He's so much better. Amen. Then the day came, he wasn't better for the midweek service and he wasn't better for the outreach time and he wasn't better for the prayer meeting and he wasn't better for the early morning Bible reading. He's just, he's, he's good enough for, um, I, okay, I'll give him an hour Sunday morning. Before long, that hour will be gone. And Paul's remembering a man that stood in the face of his entire city and raised his hand and said, I'm one of them. And now Timothy has to stand and tell the church he's one of them. That's, that's brutal. Can, can I show you how simply this thing starts? It's, it's polite to ask, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> Titus chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 5. Practical application, not mine, the Bibles. I, 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 you can find a different cross-reference if you want to, but I, could, I couldn't find one. 
Look at Ephesians 5 and verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of, of light. Isn't that great? Verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Make, makes sense. Verse number 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Be not drunk with wine, verse 18, give it thanks in all things. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Come down verse 33. Nevertheless, like and when you in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. <laughs> now, if you just got dropped on planet Earth at the age you are right now, saved, born again, believing the Bible is the Word of God, you wouldn't have any problem what you just read. But to grow up in a culture and a society that has taught you that is bondage, that is slavery, that is insulting, that is, that is cruelty, that is some sort of oppressive chauvinism, you get saved... But your entire culture says, don't do that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And you say, well, <laughs> you know, I was in darkness. Now I'm in the light. I, I'm going to do what God asked me to do and, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, approve them. I'm going to have to drop those social media friends and I'm going to have to drop those, those contacts and, and all these, these, uh, these movies and these TV shows and all this junk that's telling me that God's word is against me. Yeah. 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 Right. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, unto the Lord. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find some Ephesian women who say they're saved who say I don't have to do that. Now come to Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. Look at verse number 3. The aged women likewise that they may be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Pretty clear. What, what are older Christian women supposed to teach younger Christian women? Point one, love your husband. Point two, love your children. That th to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. How do we tell the world the Bible is the Word of God, Christianity is the way to live, following the Scriptures is the best life possible, and then sit around in person or online gabbing with a bunch of women who hate what God said? And trying to influence other women in the church to disobey what God said. It causes the Lord to be blasphemed, disrespected. When a child rebels against their parents, when a worker rebels against their employer, when a man rebels against the Word of God by not loving his wife, when a wife rebels against her husband by saying, I'm too smart, he's too stupid, I'm too spiritual, he's too carnal, I don't have to... What, what you're saying is, the Bible doesn't mean any more to me than the guys in the lodge across the street or the bar on the other side of the fence. And then you give them a gospel tract and say, this is from the Word of God. It's the greatest book ever written. You should believe it. And they say, you don't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. You want me to respect a Bible you don't respect? Well, no, it's just about getting saved. I, I believe that part. <laughs> I just want you to believe that part. Yeah, but why would I trust a Savior who you say messes up people's lives? 
It's not good. It hurts the cause of Christ when the people who claim the name of Christ rebel against the lordship of Christ. It makes those people think all you wanted to do was get out of hell when you died. You really don't trust him enough to follow him. And it's not a healthy thing. And so, listen, I know this sounds harsh. It's, it's not harsh. It's necessary. The Holy Spirit says, if that man has that belief system and that attitude, you have to let him go follow Satan. You can't work to keep him in your church. You don't, the devil do, is not entitled to have a spokesman in the church. The devil's not, so what if it's a woman? Spokesman. I'm old enough. It's not, no, we're just, we're just going to go with. Satan doesn't get a voice here. And it's the duty of the pastor to make sure he never has a voice here. Now, we, we live in perilous times. Really, we're, we're off the charts for perilous times. Because 30 years ago, when someone left the church, they were gone. Today, there's this thing called the interweb net. Online. Nobody ever really leaves your church. They've always got their their tentacles in, reaching in to try and find someone somewhere who's sympathetic to rebellion rather than sympathetic to submission and obedience to the Word of God. And you young people, you'd do well to not be influenced by people you've never met who care nothing for you, more than godly parents who would lay down their lives and die for you, and more than pastors and youth pastors and godly men and godly women whose lives are blessed and want to save you from the errors they made. Yes. Yes, you know what Brother Ross trying to do now? He's trying to keep people from having the same testimony he has. Oh, boy, what a testimony. He went down and, and got into all that, and then the Lord brought him out. No, here's a better testimony. He believed what grandmother taught him and never went down. And, and, and that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep you from being swayed by blasphemers rather than by people who certainly, surely trust the Word of God as Paul did and as Timothy did. So, so let, me, let me show you how God flipped this thing. John 10 and 1 Timothy 1. If you aren't with us this morning, you, 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 you can catch up. <laughs> it's on the internet. I hate, the, I hate being on the internet. There it is. That's where people live now. Where do you live? People say, oh, Deland, Titusville, St. Augustine. Where do you live? <laughs> Here's my web address. <laughs> and, oh, they call it an address. Their, their lives are in their, in their phones. Anyway, so Paul was, was a blasphemer. That's what he said. As a blasphemer, it was the chief sin. I disrespected God. Look at John 10, 33. John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou being a man makest thyself God. They knew exactly what he, what he said about himself. And as we saw this morning, Paul said, great man, great miracles, great teacher, but he's a blasphemer because he says he's God. And when Saul of Tarsus possible, found out Jesus was God, he stopped being a blasphemer and became a Christian. Now Alexander found that out, and he stopped being a blasphemer, and he became a Christian, and then he reverted back to blasphemy Meaning what? He lost his reverence and his respect for Jesus Christ. Now what's going to get you is not the bottle. What's going to get you is not the drugs. What's going to get you is not the lewd woman. What's going to get you is not the flirtatious man. What's going to get you is not the, the offer of all the money. What's going to get you is if you start forgetting that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. 
If he's God Almighty, you won't say, well, I don't think I have to do that. If he's God Almighty, you don't say, well, but, but I have an excuse. If he's God Almighty, you do what he says. And as soon as you start in your mind adapting an attitude that he is not the I am the Lord of glory, you'll start giving ears to people who disrespect him. And it'll take you farther than, than you think it will. You say, you're a lordship salvation person. I, I, I'm not going to argue that because everybody's got their own definition of what they think that means. All I know is if you're going to get saved, you're, you're going to have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and who serves call the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you came to him for salvation, and when you did, you understood who you were coming to. Almighty God who could save your soul or throw you into hell. Do you have that attitude when you read, I don't know, Ephesians 5? Do you have that attitude when you read 1 Timothy 1? Is he still the Lord of glory? Alexander let that slip. And his whole life slid with it. I don't want to be the person that hears the preaching, reads the Bible and says, well, I just don't think, I just don't see, well, in my situation, he's God. Verse 18, 1 Timothy 1, 18, finish up here. This charge, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Look, which some having put away concerning, nobody took it from them, they put it away. Yeah. Made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You say, how do you deliver somebody unto Satan? The same way the father delivered the prodigal son to the far country. You just let them go. You do everything you can to hold them. If they don't want to be held, you got to let them go. Why? Satan doesn't get a voice in the Sunday school class. Amen. Satan doesn't get a voice in the pulpit. Satan doesn't get a voice in the hallway. Satan doesn't get a voice in the parking lot. Satan doesn't get a voice in my social media life and sites. Don't want to hear it. Amen. Why? Because all of those voices say the same thing. <clears throat> Disrespect God disrespect God. I don't want to hear it. Don't want to hear it. I want to have the utmost respect for the one who saved my soul and wrote a book to tell me how to live. Why would I question it? Why would I argue with it? Why would I fight against it? He's God. This is the word of God. Don't let that slip. Well, it never happened to me. It happened to Alexander. He's right in the thick of things for a while, and then he was gone. Then he was gone. It's a war. A lot of veterans here, thank you. A lot of veterans. I saw one yesterday, man. I always I said, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry you had to go Vietnam, but I appreciate that you went, and, and, I, and I mean that. But I sure, don't, I sure don't want to be going into battle with 40 armed men, and one of them is sympathetic to the other side. God help us. I, I don't, I, I'd hate to be a police officer, honestly. I thank God for all, all of our police officers that are, are straight and right and, and protecting us. I, I would not want to go in a bad situation with, with eight police officers and one of them is sold out to the other side. And what's hurting, what's hurting our churches in America is we're in a war but there's a lot of people sitting in our pews and our chairs and our theater seats <laughs> yeah. that are aligned with the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And Alexander, he, he shifted allegiance. And Paul said, you got to let him go with the one he wants to follow. Yeah. Yes, sir. Don't do that. Don't be that person. Amen. Don't be that person. And if, you, if you've fallen... Get up as fast as you can, get back, get right, do whatever, whatever you got to do to get things right. You don't want Satan to wreck the rest of your life.
Amen. All right, Father, thank you for giving us the Bible. Pray God you'd help us take it as serious as it is and lead us, guide us, not just as individuals, but as a church. Do what's right in the right way. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name and amen.